Hey, good evening, everybody. It's Robert Hansen. Welcome to our very first Sunday night of the season from May to night, May 7th, all the way through the month of October. We will be appearing on Sunday nights at 7.30 p.m. Uh, just kind of double check over the summer months for any changes and modifications, but basically we'll be here every single Sunday night from at 7.30 p.m. We wanted to give you guys a chance to have the weekends like us. Uh, over this beautiful upcoming summer. And if you're brand new, thank you so much for joining us tonight. If you are one of our regulars that have been coming weekly, uh, once again, I want to thank you so very much for your participation and encouragement uh, to keep this process going. Uh, this is an open dialogue, an open discussion. Each week we pick a topic, we have interaction, I share my perspective on uh, certain experiences, and um, we cover topics such as angels and uh, the crossing over experiences and tonight we are focusing on mothers not only the mothers that we love and know the ones that raised us and so on but we're going to go a bit deeper into what it means to truly be a mother to have a mothering instinct what it is like for people who have born children have lost children being a mother what is it like for someone who has been unable to bear a child yet the insides are crying out to be a mother, and so on and so forth. So we're going to touch on some of these very, very beautiful topics tonight. Some of you may know this probably if you follow the Facebook postings uh, I've been doing over the last uh, couple of years, but particularly in the last six months. My own, my own mom, my own mom, <clears throat> went into spirit back in the month of November. It's about six months now. My mother was at the beautiful age of 90. She had a very, very fulfilled life. Uh, an educator, a teacher, a uh, professional nurse, uh, a very, very dedicated, loyal mom to me and my sisters and brothers. Uh, she was uh, an awesome, awesome wife to my father, my dad, Ed, who was a police officer that died about four years ago. Uh, my mother was also known in my own family as the matriarch. She was not, you know, perhaps the stereotypical grandmother that just sits in a rocking chair and knits all day. That was not my mother. My mother was blessed with uh, reasonably good health through most of her life until her very later years. Uh, she was very active in our community here. She was very active at our local high school, which is called Mepham High School, which is right here in the, uh, the town of Belmore, where I went to school, my kids and so on. My mother worked there for 30 years as a professional counselor. Prior to that, she was in public health as a, an educator and a nurse. My mother had a professional certificate in nursing, which is just a shade below her doctorate, her PhD. Uh, we caused that with my mother with, all, with her children and her dedication to my dad's work as a, as a police officer. So she decided to discontinue and just focus in on the family. Uh, when I think of my mom, you know, of course, uh, the instinct, I think, in most people, I think, uh, is that they try to reflect on what was good about them. I often say to people, uh, try to remember what was best. Many people say my mother was not healthy, my mother was not happy, my mother was very bitter, my mother always argued at the drop of a hat, my, must, my mother used to hurt me, my mother walked away from me, she abandoned me, and so on and so on and so on. And yet, uh, that person falls under the title of mother. And for some people, uh, their biological mother may have died when they were very young. That, bio, that mother may have gone to, to prison and had been away for 20 years. That mother may have uh, had some kind of mental challenges and uh, were not around uh, during the time of child raising. Uh, sometimes the role of the mother was delegated to um, people in uh, grandmother status, brother-sister status, sometimes... Uh, young people lose their mothers at an early age for various reasons, and they're put into foster care, or they come out of the beautiful people that adopt children, and most of those adopted parents are spectacular. We always hear about these odd, crazy stories about adopted parents, but quite frankly, I hear more crazy stories about uh, typical parents, parents underneath their own roof with their children. So there's a whole host of uh, women that fall under the title of mother. In the human animal, especially in the female, the female animal, the mammal, the female, my wife, my, my own biological mother, my children's biological mother, my wife, and so on, have been given the instinctive gift, the instinctive gift, the biological gift, the genetic gift, 
uh, at some point in their young lives, they blossom and there is this, quote, inner clock that starts ticking from the great movie My Cousin Vinny, where uh, the great actress kept stamping her feet saying, my clock is ticking, my clock is ticking. She wasn't kidding. And when that scene came out in that movie, uh, I think a great deal of the women understood it. And I think the guys did too. You know, we all kind of understood that there's a time frame uh, driven not only by the genetics, by the biology of the female organism, but also by social clock. You know, at a certain point in time, being a mother too old can be a problem. People look at you differently. She's an older mother, all of that kind of stuff. And uh, <clears throat> that also has a sociological or a social Im implication as well. In some cultures, I'm sure you guys realize this, uh, being a mother is at 14, 15, 13, 12, uh, 16. Uh, motherhood comes very, very early. 500 years ago, it was predominant. Today, mothers seem to be a little older as we get better health care, as we move forward in life, as we seem to understand the dynamics of, uh, of culture. Uh, we're no longer building tribes, as it were. We're kind of an oversized community in most cases. And uh, people realize that to have five and seven, eight, ten kids uh, is a little unusual. My wife alone is one of eight. I've met parents with up to 15 kids. This poor woman buried 15 kids. Had 15 children. It's unbelievable that some woman could be pregnant for almost 20 straight years without coming up for air. Unbelievable, right? So there's all different variations on it, all different reflexes on it, all different feels about it. But I want to go on a little bit past that. You know, within the instinct, within the reflex of the female is this drive, I was just alluding to it, uh, that brings the woman to a place internally without being told, without being told, that she needs to bear a child. Now, there are some exceptions where some women don't have that same intensified feeling. They don't have that same drive. It does not mean they are defective or something is wrong with them. I've met many women and I have, that just opt not to have children. They recognize the instinct, but they also say, I'm also a vocalist, I'm also a healer, I'm a therapist, I'm a military person, I've done something, and they have chosen to make the occupation that they do, or their dedication to a particular craft or interest, that becomes, quote, their child. Outsiders might say, oh, well, they're so selfish, and uh, they could have had babies, and they chose not to. I give them a lot of respect because they know, honestly, within themselves to bring a child into this world, to take on the responsibility of life itself, uh, is an enormous, enormous responsibility. It is loving, it is beautiful, it is awesome, but it also has tremendous limitations to it. Travel, finance, money, sickness, intervention, and that list gets very heavy. And some people watch it, they see it, they see how much other people struggle with it, and they watch a parent respectfully who has lost a child or has a child with profound challenges or a very, very terminally ill child, and someone says, I may want to be a mother in the worst way, but I don't want to take the chance of going through that, going through that. And they just opt to step off. And, you know, I, as I said a moment ago, I really respect that in these guys because they understand that they cannot give what is required. And there is nothing wrong with that. And then there are people that really have that instinct, they have that sense, and they really love being a mother. The gift of motherhood comes to them as not only a blessing, but it, come, it becomes their life's work. It literally becomes their life's work. That is their signature on their experiences as an adult person. Everything revolves around their children their family unit, their spouse in most cases, but in particular, their children. So we can see through the types of parenting, the types of mothering, the types of relationships, the types of exposure, all identify what brings that mothering instinct. By contrast, guys like me, men, we may have sensitivity to our children, we may have comfort being given to our kids, our primal instinct is to prepare our children to deal with the externals in the world, right? Men, biologically, genetically, historically, are the hunters by trade, we call them. They go out into the world. They are the protectors. They go out. They hunt 
uh, the animal if we needed to back in the day. They would go out and build the fences. They would protect the family. They would band up with other guys of the tribes or other guys within the fortress, uh, whatever it might be. And they represented the stronger, more powerful external guy, right? The woman, of course, was typically, typically, uh, made to be the gatherer. She would go out, plant the corn, she would do this, she would do that, she would raise the children, breastfeed the baby, take care of the sick, take care of the elderly people, and the men understood it. You know, I, I, was, I spent a lot of time in, in and out of Japan. I think most of you probably have known that about me, and, you know, the typical Japanese thing says the woman is behind the man, the, walks, the man walks in ahead of the woman. And it can come across to an American, especially to a European type guy, or woman, of course, that somehow it's subservient. It's really not its intent. It's really a very high level of respect. They move in front of any danger ahead of the wife. They move in front of danger ahead of any female. That's what they are typically taught to do. Are there the rare examples? Well, of course, they minimize the woman and they injure her or harm her or make her feel belittled. Yes. That's true in this country, that's true over there, that's true in Russia, that's true in South America, that's true everywhere. That somehow men seem to feel because they are physically stronger, superior stronger in most cases, that we have a right to control and dominate, punish, right herd, put the boot on the neck, slap around, all of that stuff to the female. You know, some of it's cultural, some of it's genetic, some of it's driven. And at least under my roof and the roofs of the people I raise, we know that that is just not a tolerant behavior on any level for any reason. But that argument falls off the, off the grid in many other cultures. So the role of the mother and the role of the wife, but particularly of the mother, is not as revered as it is in our culture. And it is not as revered in some cases as in this culture. I'm not minimizing or in any way suggesting that all cultures have minimizations of the mother. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is there are situations, and I'm sure you've all seen it, where women are forced to wear certain robe attire and have very, very limited lives and really limited experiences and so on. Before we continue, I just want to welcome our new friends to come in. Anyone that is coming back for the first time, uh, anyone that's repeating coming back, please Please, please, welcome aboard, welcome aboard, and if you could do me a favor, just let me know where you come from. If you're coming out of Nevada, if you're coming from our friends up in Canada, if you're coming out of the Deep South, our great Southern Fair Americans, if you're coming from New Hampshire, let us know. We'd just like to get an idea where you're coming from. Let your friends know we're here. Let them know that we do this on a Sunday night. It's on the house. We love doing it, and we're going to continue on this topic of mothers. So being a mother is not just the biological process of bearing a child. A woman, a female, can bear a child. If she is biologically equipped to do so, she has intimacy with the male counterpart, and the result can be the birth of a newborn. All right? The female gives birth to the baby. Instinctively, the baby seeks the mother, and by instinct, the mother seeks the child. It is just the nature of things. It's almost uh, the same way that we have this contrast of uh, night and day. One definitely gives rise to the other. It just is the way it happens. It happens also within the child. However, there is a movement of thought, there is a movement that is driven by other mechanisms where the woman that bears the child remains basically a woman that bears a child. That's it. Her intention her giving herself, her surrendering of herself, her letting her child know on all of the levels of spiritual light that that child is just a byproduct of a sexual relationship. And then there are women who not only have that same intimate relationship and bear the child, but they become a mother. Their energy, their heart, their soul, their hands, their eyesight, their breath, Every bone in their body is dedicated and devoted to the raising of their baby. And they will protect that baby at their own life. They insulate them from harm. They guide them. They nestle with them. And if you watch in Mother Nature, the birds with little birds under their wings, the lion that brings her cubs to her chest, the elephant that drops its trunk over its baby, the giraffe that brings the baby underneath, which we just had that miracle birth of that beautiful giraffe and mother. You can watch it. 
Very rarely, and I mean very rarely, in natural, in mother nature, does, does the mother that bears the child reject its calf or its cub. It is extremely rare unless they sense injury or sickness. And they have no choice. Perhaps there's a famine, there's water, and the baby dies off and the mother whines and cries and maybe hits its hooves and then eventually has to leave her baby. But barring that, do not go near the mother when she has a cub nearby. Don't do it or you're going to wish for something else. That is a beautiful instinct that is not taught to the female. It is something that has been genetically implanted since the male and female first showed up on this earth. So being, quote, a good mother is always a balancing act, isn't it? How much direction do I give? How much do I allow my little one to fall and learn? How much discipline do I give? How much favoritism do I give? How much encouragement do I give? How much discouragement for certain behavior do I give? I think you've all heard this many, many times, that talk is cheap, right? Talk is cheap. You can tell your child to do this. You can tell your child to do that. You can demand your child to do this. You can demand your child to do that. You're big. You're towering over them. They're only a little tiny thing, a year, two years old. They're only little babies. They're infants in your arms. And all that time, you as the primary, the primary, the mother is the primary light in their lives. It outshadows everything else. It outshadows everything else. That radiant consciousness that these beautiful women have for their children is their beacon in the darkness. They seek the mother when they're sick. They seek the mother when they're tired. They seek the mother when they're happy. They seek the mother's protection. When those are interrupted, when the baby is left in the room to cry itself to sleep, when the mother is on the couch and she's uh, watching TV and the baby is crying, when the baby's diaper is not attended to, when the baby is hungry, when the baby is sick, and that is neglected over a period of time. I'm not talking about the head cold, the mother's trying to be careful and the baby's crying and she says to her husband, hey Rob, go in there and do it. I don't want to get the baby any sicker. I'm sick myself. I'm not talking about that stuff. Of course, you know what I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a propensity to not nurture, not mother, not, excuse me, to not nurture, not mother the child. Not to give that child a sense of stability, safety, security, intimacy, loving care, compassion, where they can turn to the mother no matter what the situation and know that that mother will be um, taken care of, that that mother will be controlled, that mother will be focused, that mother will help, that mother will guide, and that child will feel secure, that child will feel safe, that child knows it will not be attacked nor abused. It must be very frightening for a three-year-old or a two-year-old or a four-year-old or a five-year-old and older to turn to their mother figure with fear. It must be really rough. I mean, if the child's, you know, broken a window or thrown something on the floor and the mother has a normal a bark reaction, her mother has a normal growl, that's perfectly normal. It's the mother's way, and it's true in nature, too, that the mother will put its foot down, scratch the sand, bark at the child, growl at the puppy, and say, don't do that, don't do that. You know, the baby goes to run across the street. A good mother will step up and, and try to um, help that baby recognize that it's not okay. Now, if the mother tries to talk it out of a two-year-old and say, listen, it's not a good idea that you run across the street, the baby is not going to listen to that. It doesn't understand it. It's going to run across the street again because they think they're playing. The mother may come by, and we've done it ourselves, give them a little hit on the hiney and say, hey, and you change your voice and say, don't do it. Don't do it. And it injects into the child a certain response that says, whoa, I never heard her really talk like that before. What is that sound? And it tells the child that something is not quite settled and that the mother is protecting. Now, if that comes across as a punishing thing, if that comes across as an intensely annoyed thing, that it aggravates the mother, it displeases the mother, then the child is minimized. The child is compressed. The child now approaches the mother figure out of fear and anxiety. It's frightened to make a mistake. And quite frankly, my friends, every one of us learn through mistakes. If we didn't make mistakes, we would have nothing to learn. We would be perfect all the time, correct? So therefore, when the person is learning, when the baby is evolving, the mother is in charge, really is in charge, of directing how this child receives compliments 
and directs how this child receives criticism. Right? And we all learn from that. And sadly and positively on both sides, of course, sometimes not so good, other times awesome, the child learns to recognize that they can trust the mother, come to the mother, love the mother, respond to the mother, not be necessarily at distance from the mother figure or the mom. And that is true of an adopted parent. You know, there are women I've met in my work, you know, sadly, um, something occurred to them when they were 14 or 15 years old. Somebody took advantage of them, rolled over them. They didn't realize consequences of having intimacy. A baby comes. The parent says, you know what? You can't have a baby at 15. You're too little. You'll never give this baby a life. And they arrange for adoption with a beautiful family. As I said earlier, there are some crazy stories about some crazy people, but most of the people I've met that are adopted parents are outstanding. I just met a woman the other day. She has 10 kids. 10 kids. 10. Five are adopted. I went over and shook her hand. And she was just outstanding. And her other children were with her. Some of her adopted kids and her own biological kids were there. They were well-dressed. They were groomed. They were polite. They were respectful. They were happy. They were hugging and kissing. It was great. I mean, I was like, wow. I don't know how this woman raises 10 kids. But that's another story. But oh my God, she was a great mom. And yet I've met other mothers who I've met. And I'm not attacking. Uh, their child makes one sound, moves out of the room, doesn't get an A-plus on every report. And all they do is brutalize them. Yell at them, scream at them, hit them, hurt them, ignore them. You're not good as you should be. Your brother's better than you. The neighbor across the street kid's better than you. You know, you're only a, a farm worker. Uh, you're nothing. You're not a doctor. What's the matter with you? All of that stuff. And that's coming out of the voice, out of the source, out of the stable from which they were born. And that child to that mother in that case almost becomes an enemy to the mother because that mother has lost her instinct and she is driven by her thoughts and social pressure and a demand that her child perform for her under the veil, well, I want my kid to be good. If you want your child to have a good life, you teach them respect, you teach them compassion, you learn to listen, you learn to pay attention to them. In the same way you want your child to listen to you when you talk, right? That little one wants to know that they have a voice too, and they need to be heard. They may, not to, they may need to have a little tiny voice. They need to say, Mommy, I don't want to kiss that woman, Aunt May, who I've never met in my life. And the mother says, you go kiss Aunt May. Go give her a kiss. She, you're going to make her upset. And what have you done? The child's instinct says, I don't want to kiss a stranger. I don't know who that stranger is. My mother is telling me she'll be mad at me if I don't kiss that stranger. So I guess it's okay to kiss a stranger. You can minimize that comment, but I'm telling you that's what happens. And the child is told to do something it knows instinctively not to do because it makes the mother feel socially upset. The child hasn't performed right. All that kind of stuff, you know? So being a mother is a very, very, very complex affair. I have met women that for whatever personal reasons, and there's no judgment, please, I'm not judging, I'm just sharing, that <clears throat> will never breastfeed their babies. Will not. They're frightened of it. It hurts them. It bothers them. It upsets them. Whatever it might be. And they choose to go a natural style with, you know, a kind of pre-made milk and all of that other stuff. They even have a surrogate mom and breastfeed for that baby in some cases where there's illness or something. But there are women that just don't want that part of it. They just don't want it. For whatever reason, they don't want it. And I'm not saying the baby's hurt or harmed. However, however, there is a bonding that takes place in that intimacy. And that has gone back for 500,000 years. Some psychologists who want to support the non-breastfeeding will say it doesn't really matter. You can make it up in other areas. And that's probably true if you're attentive to it and you pay attention to it and you do do it. Yeah. And then there are those private moments where the mother has the baby to her breast. My daughter just had this with my granddaughter. And she put an appropriate shawl over. And we would sit at the dining room table. My daughter would feed our the little baby, Maddie, and as an infant. And I'm telling you, it was like a light just hung over our dining room table. It was absolutely beautiful to witness. Beautiful. My other children, my youngest daughter, Kyla, my other kids saw it. It was all done very appropriately and, you know, hidden. 
it, there's a certain amount of sacredness to that. It's not for their eyes to see, but it was for their souls to watch. And they watched their older sister, Jess, take care of this beautiful, her firstborn baby. I remember this, guys. I remember this. And I said this to another friend of mine who just had a little boy named Vincent recently. Her and her partner, Nikki, had a little, beautiful little boy named Vincent. And I'll use my daughter, Jessica, too, and my niece, Jackie, for that matter, who just had baby Brooke, who I was with today. And I said to all three of them, all three of them at different times, I said, you guys have something that guys can never have. No matter how great a man's life can be or not be, we will never understand, we can never recognize, we can never feel, ever, ever, what it's like to be a mother. We may take care of our kids, we may step up and roll up our sleeves and do the dishes and help our wife out and even change diapers, which I can do with both hands in the dark. I can jiggle babies in the air, basically. Feed them, give them bottles, give them formula, do all that. Good stuff. I can do that. We can do it here. Well, my kids can all do it. We, they've been raised around it all their lives, you know. We want it to be an interactive family. I can say to my youngest one, take the baby, go over there and change your diaper. No problem, Daddy. I can say to the other guy, listen, go make the bottle, do this, do that. No problem, Dad. And they can do it. It's great because they've watched it. It's part of a family. It's what you give your children. And you can give your children money. You can give them a good education. You can give them the right college. You can give them the right school. You can buy them a nice car. You can do all the good stuff. It's all good. Nothing wrong with it. But have you given them and I, I'm sure most of you great people have, a real sense of family, a real sense of unity, a real sense that we are in this together as one family. If one is falling, there are five to pick you up. Right? And the primary person that's telling us to do all of this is my wife, Kathleen. Right? Is my mother, God rest her soul and spirit. My mother-in-law, Mary, God rest her. She's still here. She's a beautiful woman in her early 90s who had eight kids, by the way, eight children. And um, this is how our families work. This is what mothers do. It's not just the title. It's, a, it's an expression of complete love. Being a mother is sacred. It is gorgeous. It is beautiful. It is powerful. It is. It is. You know? So to take care of our children, to do what we have to do, is a big part of it. And for the men, we're on the edge of it. When the baby's sick at 2 in the morning, they don't want their father, they want their mother. When they're scared of the ghosts in the closet, they want their mother. Maybe the dad will step in too, but, you know, that kind of stuff. When there's trouble outside the house, they call the dad. They're, they do. My kids will say, call daddy. Someone bothered me, and I'm out the front door without even pausing. You know, that kind of a thing. When my car broke up, 4 in the morning, I'm out in the rain. You know, that's me. My wife will do that too, of course, if necessary. I, I've seen her do it. But she's at home watching the home front, and she's taking care of the other ones that are here and making sure that they feel safe and they feel secure. You know, that's really part of being this, uh, this great role of a mother. I'm just going to check my notes real quick here for a minute. <clears throat> now, on a physiological level, on a physiological level, we often say that the genetics, you know, the intimacy is what created the life form. And it does. That's the biology of it. That's what happens. And we, all, we also can discuss, of course, the DNA, the intervention of DNA, and the modifications in the womb, and all of this gives rise to the birth of the child, hopefully healthy. Some children are born with great intelligence, some are born with minimal intelligence, some are born with challenges, some are born with exceptional skills, and different heights, different weights, different colors, different textures. Uh, it's just oh, it's endless. It's endless. And when we think of mothers and children, we tend to think locally, don't we? The mothers in my town of Merrick, the town of Belmore, where I live around. We don't typically project to a mother in uh, Croatia. We don't particularly project to a mother in the Philippines. We don't think of it in those terms. But I don't care where you go. I don't care where you go, what part of this globe you land on. That mother is a mother. It is called a communal or a continuous reflection of what is often called Gaia. Gaia in the Hindi religion means the energy of the life of earth itself, the radiance of life, the radiance of life, and it flows through the female. Without the female, without the mother, life does not continue. She has been chosen as the source of creation. Please listen again. The mother, the mother, not the man, the mother, has been chosen to bear 
the source of life's creations. And when I mean bear, I don't mean bear as a burden. I mean bear as a joy. Does it have its challenges? Does it have its difficulties? Oh my God, yes. Oh my God, yes. And I'm a guy on the outside and I can see it. My poor wife at times, you know, I mean, with the kids and the sicknesses and the hospitals and the stitches and the cuts and the bruises and I'm scared. And, wow. It, it still goes on. And they're all adults and my, they still run to their mother. It's it's great to watch. They don't come, they come to me, but they come to my wife, Kathleen, 10 to 1. That's just where they go. That's their source. You know, and it's great to watch. It's wonderful to see it. Right? So when you have this source, when you have this mothering source... There's an opening that occurs. We call it a portal, P-O-R-T-A-L, like a doorway. And in that doorway, not only is there a movement of thought and emotion, but there is a spiritual movement that occurs. It's called consciousness. For some of you, you like the term soul. Either, either works. It's just a social term, that's all. Some people call it the Atman, the eternal life that lives within. Whatever lingo you like, it doesn't really matter. It's, I, we're pointing to a thing that is within us. It is the source where love rises from, that dedication rises from, it gives birth to compassion, it gives birth to life itself. When the movement of consciousness is seeking entry into physical phenomena, whether it be female, male, I mean through the, through the woman, of course, but driving the biology of it, it could be a cat having a litter, the movement of life itself seeks the window through which it will attach on the same vibrational tone that it will connect to. Meaning, prior to the birth of your child, prior to the physical phenomena, the consciousness, that which is in the unseen realms, in the realm of angels, if you like, which out beyond touch, it is now getting ready, it is being called, as it were, to make an appearance. Life is beginning to stream through the female. Once it enters through the female, it then comes in touch with the seed and the egg, and all of it completes itself. So now you have spirit and body merging together. You have spirit and body merging together as a sacred phenomena. It is then that the spirit will move through the form or the body of the developing infant. Yes? It is there that the physical phenomena can shift. Meaning, there could be challenges, there could be a death internally within the pregnancy which breaks the woman's heart and she's so excited to have her baby and spirit says I cannot complete my journey through this form this form has challenges we cannot come through this form and it will release and move back into the one life hovering again and it hovers around that same source it hovers like this, because it wants to enter that mom, but it senses that. For the mother, it's heartbreaking, because she's expecting it, the husband is crying, the wife is inconsolable. Uh, we went through it here in my own roof. I, I, I can't get into it too personally, but we went into it several times here in our own house. I saw it. I saw my mother lose an infant at birth. It, bro it broke her in half. For a long time, it really took my mother down. When I was a young boy, she lost a child. So I understand it, not as a mother would understand it. You can't, you can't even talk about how much it hurts the female. A guy can't do it. It's not within our capacity to do it. It's not our fault. It's not a defect. You know, it's just we can't. It doesn't mean for the men that we have an excuse not to be caring. That's all a bunch of baloney. If any guy's a stand-up guy and he's a father and he's really a man, a man, you will stand at the side of that woman and help her. You don't just turn your back and say, that's on you. That's not a man. At least not in my opinion, anyway. Okay? So when they come through, the soul, the spirit, if you like, the sense, the angel, the, if you like, last week we talked about it, the angels enter, 
and they say, I'm sorry, this can't work here. Now, in some cases, is enough physical phenomena remaining that the entry of the soul completes itself. And that child may come into the world with certain challenges, certain restrictions, certain limitations. It may have autism, it may have cerebral palsy, it may have heart conditions, it may be born with a single limb, it may have been born blind, it may have a deafness. Much of that has resulted from the interaction in the physical phenomena. It was not sent this way, it evolved this way. But even as you look into the evolution of this kind of altered being, or this young baby that comes in with Down syndrome, if you look into the eyes, past, past the physical phenomena, you will see the radiant light. You will. You will. You will see the essence of creation looking back at you. And that is a miracle. And for many women, they see that too. And their baby, their little infant, their joy, their bundle, becomes their entire world because they have now completely fused, they have connected mother spirit, spirit of child into one. And then the mother has more kids, right? So someone says, well, how can it just, how does that happen? I mean, you said it goes to one, now all of a sudden there's six and they can spread it out? Absolutely, just like the sun does to us. God's sun, the sun of light, it, it, it shines on us all. There's no discretion, see, there's no distinctions, it just floods everybody, right? The radiance of the sunlight. It's the same within spirit. It is when it gets into the human phenomena that things go crazy. That's because we are driven by thought and emotion, which alters our behavior, and as a result, we don't come from natural innocence as a parent, we come out of a distortion as a parent, which has been conditioned through hundreds of thousands of years of the human evolution. The same evolution that brings beautiful babies into the world, but it's also the same evolutionary process that has had children slaughtered. And it breaks the hearts of every mother out there. You can see them weeping, laying in sand and in broken cement, holding their child. They don't care what the hell's going on. They have that baby in their arms, and I'm sure you've seen images of this. It is heartbreaking. If you're coming in tonight new, if you're brand new, thank you so much for being here tonight. I'd love to know where you come from. I'd love to know where you guys are from. If you're returning, let me know again. If you have some new people joining it, let me know. We, we, this is amongst friends. We're friends. I've got to know you guys for the last few weeks. If you want to throw a question my way a little bit, please feel free to do that. If you want to make a comment, please do that. We've got some time ahead of us, and I'd like to try to address a little bit. I'm just going to bump, go to my notes for a minute. I want to make sure I don't miss anything that's important for us. Um, <clears throat> sometimes it's asked, why do certain children suffer at the hands of their mother? Right? Why are there certain cruelties that mothers do? Abandoning them, hurting them, and all of that. <clears throat> well, that would take a, a whole evening to discuss on a spiritual level. I'm not talking on a physical level. On the physical phenomena, if a child is being burned, being scolded, being injured, you call the cops. You act as a witness. You do everything you can to protect that child's life and to remove that, quote, female, not the mother, the female, from the presence of the child. Mothers don't do that. Mothers don't do that. A female under the banner of mother might do that. Is that clear? A mother will never allow that to occur, nor will she harm her child. It's against every reflex she has genetically. Every reflex. But, through society, through being abused herself as an infant coming up, they don't know any differently. A man on the cross said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. In karma in Japan, as the Buddhist traditions, they say, basically, forgiveness must be given uh, in order for life to be renewed. You have to renew it. You have to forgive it. It doesn't mean you allow it to continue, and it doesn't mean they don't have the disciplines or the appropriate uh, I hate to use the word punishments, the appropriate behavior has to be regulated so that harm does not continue. Are there people that turn away? Are there people that cover it up? Are there people that avoid it? Absolutely. These beautiful little babies last summer in the city, little boy six years old, little African-American boy six years old was beaten to death, right? 
It happens in a lot of cultures. It's not an African American thing, obviously not. It happens in every culture. I'm just happening. That little boy broke my heart. I saw that little boy and I said, oh my God, how could you not love this child? That's little, beautiful, beautiful brown eyed, beautiful little skinned boy, beautiful. And, and the mother and the, and the father did some terrible things and that little boy died. Dear God in heaven, that was not a mother. That was a woman that had a baby with some other guy. Don't confuse it, please. You have to, I hate to say the word earn, but I guess you do. You have to earn the right to be called the mother. Talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. I can tell you straight up, my wife has earned every bit of it. And I'm not here to pump up my wife, but she has. And my own biological mother was incredible. It was just incredible. I owe her everything. Everything. My mom was just everything to me. And yet when my mother passed, which was only six months ago, I was completely at peace with it. Because I knew she had given me everything she had. I know that. I just know it. And when her death came, and when spirit called her home, and uh, the consciousness, the good Lord, whatever you like to call it, decided to call my mother back, and said, you know, Anne, my mom's name, there's no more suffering, you have a terrible infection, uh, yeah, we don't want you to suffer anymore, sweetheart, please come home, come on. And death came, and the angel of death showed up, we leave my mother with suffering, we cried, of course my mother's physical presence I missed, yeah, of course, of course I do. But other than that, I know my mother's a deep peace, and... She's around me all the time. I don't worry about it. I know she looks in on my kids. I know she looks in on my wife. I know she looks in on my brother. I know she has my brother and her godchild and everybody else, her grandchildren, on the other side with her. I know it. I don't have to, I'm not convincing myself of it. I just know it. Uh, the work I do, I know it, and I hope you guys believe me a little bit, that anyone you love that's especially a mother figure to any of you, any of you, um, they are at peace with you and at rest, as long as they are a mother. If your mom, with all respect, was hard-edged, kind of distant, cruel, had some kind of a coldness to them, an indifference, couldn't generate emotions, it's not their fault. Something overrode their instincts. It was just what happened to them. And in the loop of consciousness, you experienced it. Now, you can say that you had a rough childhood. You can say you had a bad upbringing. You can say that your mother never kissed you. You can say that you got locked in closets. And I, I, good God, it may have really happened to you. And it may have been terrible for you. And your mother may have never said she loved you. And your mother may have gone as far as to say, you know what, I wish you were never born. I've heard that. I mean, it rips a hole in my chest as a man. I couldn't imagine a little three-year-old being told by its mother, I wish the hell you were never born. Dear God, how that little baby must feel. But growing up, that baby also has now an extraordinary opportunity to never allow that process to renew itself. That child actually becomes a healer unto itself and will make a statement, this behavior ends with me. This behavior ends with me. And as of today, my children will only know love and completeness. They will not have to go through what I endured, you see? So there's always a hidden blessing in any suffering. It is called the gift of grace. If you're coming back for the first time, thank you so much for being here for the first time. If you're a first time, it's great to have you. If you're a repeating person, it's great to have you back. I love having you guys. Please welcome aboard. Please share it. Let me know where you're coming from. If you want to send out a question, I'd be happy to take it. But let me continue. Thanks. <clears throat> you know, when a child passes on, let me restate that. When a child loses its mother, if your child loses its mother, it has not only lost its direct source, it has had a severing, a severing of its physiological phenomena. It's had a severing of its physiological phenomena. In other words, it's source, its supply line has been cut. And as well intended as the dad is, as well intended as the grandmother is, as well intended as the sister is, as well intended as the community may be, it leaves a vacancy. That is why the mothering instincts are so completely powerful. On a spiritual plane, no matter what happened to the mother, she will never leave her child, and her child will know that on another level of peace. That will come up in another evening's topic. 
But if you have someone that's young, especially young, and I'm, when I mean young, I'm talking under the age of 30, but if, or under the age of 40, if you like, but I'm especially referring to little guys, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10, 12, 15 year olds that have lost their mom early and everyone's got their mother at the play and everyone's got their mother taking them to get their haircuts and buy a dress and, you know, watch them at their baseball games with their dad in the stands. And this little one looks for their mother and there's no one to be found. That's an opportunity for people that love that family to step up and be. I'm not another mother to you. You don't even have to say it. But you can bring and shift the instinct as a mother to your own children and aim that same instinct. Because being a mother is a matter of behavior. It's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of love. It's a matter of compassion. It is a beautiful, sacred title. I mean, with all respect, this is not religion, but in the Christian faith, they call Mary, the, the, the woman that bore the, the life of Jesus, the, of Nazareth, they call her the Blessed Mother, the Mother Figure. In India, they have a term called the, the Divine Mother, the Sacred Mother, the Mother of us all. These kind of things. That which gives life is the most radiant expression of God light on earth. It is the continuum of light. That which takes away light is the opposite, the darkness of earth. Right? That is the opposite. So the mother's role is to enhance light. The female role often diminishes light. And the child becomes the burden, not the joy. <clears throat> I did a post the other night about um, how much excited or how excited I was when my little granddaughter kissed my face and said hi, Papa, to me. I almost fainted. I mean, I swear to you, I almost, I couldn't catch my breath. I thought my soul was going to explode. She's just starting to speak. She's got about maybe eight or ten words now. And one of them happens to be, hi, Papa. And for my beautiful wife, Kathleen, she'll say, hi, Mama. Hi, Mama. She'll say it like that. Even though it's not her mother, she calls the female that she loves, Mama. My, my little granddaughter has a real mother, my, my daughter Jessica, but there's also um, her grandmothers, you know, Lynn and Kate. And my little granddaughter feels that and knows that, and they all have that same mothering. And my granddaughter and my niece, little Brooke, and her family, and Karen, her grandmother, and all of that, have that same beautiful, beautiful, beautiful vibration that they bring and give to the children. So the child's radiant soul, they feel that mothering like this. And that is the role of our great, great, great grandmothers. Our grandmothers are awesome. If you're a nana, if you're a grandma out there, you are extraordinary. Not only are you a great grandmother, which is the second tier of mothering, but you also are a mother that set up the tone within your own biological uh, family. Right? Grandmothers are precious. I'm sure you know this, that many grandmothers, many, not all, but many, are relegated to the dark rooms, they're delegated to rocking chairs, what they say is, oh, that's just an old lady talking. Man, you guys don't know what the hell you're talking about. You don't know what you're talking about. Those people are full of wisdom, they have experience, they are devoted, they have survived life, they are, they are a, a treasure of treasures. My mother, and I'm not saying this to brag, People would sit with her who were brilliant people and sought her counsel. My mother, my, my mother-in-law Mary is the same way. She comes from West Virginia, up in the mountains. But that woman has an instinctive wisdom that you can't buy in a store. She's incredible. I mean, I'm not just saying this. She's incredible. We have, your grandmothers are awesome. And please pay attention to them. They're not getting in your way. They are offering their heart, their soul, their counsel because they love you and they're trying to dedicate themselves to the family and to continue the heritage of love and family and U.S. of A. and all of that great stuff that we've been taught as children and to respect each other and love each other. Are there variations along the way? Sure. But you know, let me tell you something about those variations. If you don't like the way it was done, fix it. Don't use it as an excuse to continue to do it yourself. That's a bunch of crap. That's a bunch of crap. Really. You see there's a harm, fix the harm and don't do it. And bring to your children what you know is the right thing to do. Stop using the past to make it 
and reason to change, to act in a certain harsh way now. That's a bunch of baloney. It really is. It gets my flare up a little bit, as you can probably tell in my voice. We all make mistakes. We want our kids to be perfect, and we don't want, and we are allowing ourselves not to be perfect. What a bunch of hoo ha, right? We all fall down. We all have to stand up. I've made a billion mistakes. My wife has made a billion mistakes. But the point is, we forgive and we move on, and that is the key. That is the key, and that's what grandmothers bring. You may have some nutty grandmother that doesn't want to listen to anything. Yeah, of course. We can always find the exception to the rule. I guess we can do that to justify ourselves. But I'd rather find the rule than the exception. I'd rather point out 20 great-grandparents than two bad ones. That's me, anyway. I'm just letting you know how I come across as a guy and as a dad and as a father, you know? Just bear with me. I have a question. i just like to read it, and I'll be with you in a moment, okay? Thanks. Okay, this comes from a young lady named Maria, and she's explaining that she's having a very, very, very hard time getting over the loss of her mother. She can't get around it. She can't get settled. It's been plaguing her for quite some time, and she asked me, what do I do about it? Right? The first thing you do is nothing. No thing. Why do I say that? Because what happens is <clears throat> you become caught in a tug of war. I feel this way. I don't want to feel this way. I want to feel a different way. But I can't feel a different way because I feel this way. And that becomes a struggle. And that makes you feel less than, inferior to. Everybody's wounds heal differently. There are people that can get a cut on their arm and it's somehow like magic. In two days it's, it's better. How they do it, who the heck knows? I don't know. And then there are people that have other factors involved, diabetes and things, and they can get a wound, and it could take six months. It's not their fault. It's just their biology. It is very similar in grief. There are certain people who on many levels, I've talked about this seven weeks ago, chemical level, physical level, intellectual level, biological level, emotional level, psychic level, spiritual level, these, all of these levels take place in the human phenomena. It's not just thought and emotion. Everybody thinks it's just here and here. It's not correct. You have spiritual levels, psychic levels, emotional levels, intellectual levels, chemical levels. It's very complex. And in many cases, that attaches to another form, our sense of identity, our sense of courage, our sense of security, our sense of safety, is all put into another person. It may be put into a home, it may be put into a career, it may be put into your talent, and you totally invest every bit of yourself, sometimes consciously, sometimes not recognizing it, and then suddenly, there's an absence of it, or at least there's a perceived absence of it, right? And the next thing you know, so there's a big vacancy, and I am seeking my mother, I am seeking that security again, and when I can't find it immediately... I begin to panic, I have anxiety, I fall into depression. In some cases it can be very profound, and if you've got profound depression, morbid depression, serious depression, you must seek intervention with the top, top, top guys you can find in the field of counseling and in the field of medicine and so on and so on and so on. That's not my role here. That's not my role here. I'm not a counselor. My role here is to guide and a little bit of my experiences. I want to be clear about that stuff, okay? But if you have normal responses, as any beautiful daughter would have to her mother. The way through the grief is the grief. Maria, listen to me, please. I lost my mom um, in my mid-60s. My mother was in my life, obviously, for my 60-plus years. We lived next door to my mother uh, for the last 20 years of my life. My mother and I saw each other on a daily basis. Daily basis. I saw my mom every day. Every day. I watched her get sick. I watched her die. I watched everything. And it, and it affected me. But I also see my mother as more than just her body and her shape. I saw my mother on so many levels. There was such a beauty, a radiance. Your mother lives. The mere fact, Maria, that you're asking me this question tells me how much your mother meant to you. It tells me how much your mother loved you. Do you understand, Maria, how much she has given you that will never separate from you? It can never leave you. This is your mother living through you, within you, for you. And when you really start to see that, you'll recognize and wake up like I did many, many years ago, 
that you can never lose them. What you lose is the idea of them, the physical idea of them. We all have that. Sure we do. Everyone does. Unless you just want to made out of stone and you cover your heart and say, I don't feel anything. You know, you become indifferent to something. That becomes more stone than person. That's not impressive. It doesn't impress people that you turn your back on someone because it hurts. Are there times to toughen up? Absolutely. Are there times you can't expose your compassion and you have to be a stand-up tough guy? Absolutely. Are there times my wife goes into, you know, like a ferocious rage to protect the kids? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm not minimizing and saying you become a fluffball. <laughs> no way. But what we really seek and what we really look for is that deep sense of connection and love. So, Maria, please, for tonight, I know it's a short explanation, but please, your mother's physical body had to leave for a reason, whether it be illness or accident or other purposes. That's the movement of consciousness. That's something you cannot control. No one can control it. But every legacy she has left, the joys, the happiness, the frustrations, the sorrows, all of it, that is her loving compliment to you. That is her epitaph to you. Okay? So I wanted to make sure you understood this, sweetheart. I hope, Maria, I hope this helped you a little bit. Now, there are women out there who are thinking about becoming a mother, right? As I mentioned repeatedly, my own daughter had our first grandchild a year and a half ago. Uh, it's coming up again that she wants to be a mom. She's maybe thinking about expanding her family, right? Some people say one's enough. Oh, my God, I can't take another one for another hundred years because <laughs> it's a lot to take care of a child. And when you're really dedicated to a child, it takes a lot of energy. That's why women have babies when they're younger. You know, Mother Nature wasn't foolish. It didn't say, well, you have women when you're 80, you have babies when you're 80, you have babies when you're 16 to 40, 45, because they know you're going to need it, the energy, all of it, right? It's, it's really quite beautifully laid out, by the way. It is quite beautiful. And the one thing that a mother wants for any one of her children is to grow up and be free. When a mother makes a child dependent on the mother forever, forever, unfortunately, that's a misplaced part of mothering. Because the mother then is mothering for the mother's safety and the mother's security and the mother's well-being. She's not mothering for her child. She's mothering kind of for herself, too. It's very common. I get it. But it's really kind of off the mark a little bit as a mom. The real role of a mother. There's a great quote. I'm sure some of you have heard it. Um, a, a parent gives a child two things. Let's say a mother gives a child two things, if you prefer to use that. Uh, one is roots, steady, solid. And the other is wings, to set them free, let them fly. Right? When you let someone, when a mother lets a child go free, they are free with the child. That's very beautiful. To be free with your children is wonderful. To be free from your children implies that your children have been a pain in the tail, that they're nothing but a burden. Are there children that put tremendous pressure on their parents? Are there children that demand of their parents? Are there children that are greedy son of a guns on their parents? Absolutely. And as a human being, does a parent have the right to say enough? Absolutely. Being a mother doesn't mean you become a punching bag. Being a mother doesn't mean you mean a doormat. Being a father doesn't mean you become a punching bag or a doormat either. Nor a grandmother or a grandfather. We are guides to help them live a fulfilled life. And the true guiding comes from the nature of our very souls. Our compassion, our heart, our giving, our loving, our sharing, our being there when needed, and our being there when we're not needed, just to let them know that we appreciate them, you know? Listen, by the way, if you want to get in touch with me, I'm on Instagram, I'm on YouTube, I'm on Pinterest, I'm on Facebook. I'll be on this Sunday, next Sunday night, next Sunday night, a week from tonight, 7.30, it's going to be all about questions about me. How did this gift happen to me? What was my background? How did I handle it? It's a Q&A night. It's an open question and answer evening on Mother's Day. That'll be next Sunday night. It's a late night, Mother's Day evening, 7.30. I hope all of you have a great Mother's Day, but I'm going to be here. I'm taking my wife out for the day. I'm going to see. I'm going to go to the cemetery, put flowers on my mom's grave. I'll do all the things that I'm sure most of you guys are going to do. We'll sit around and talk about my mother. For those of you that are about to have a baby or are thinking about having a baby, when we prepare to have a child, girls, when you prepare, getting settled, getting ready, tuning in, tuning into all of the dynamics, all of the inner mechanisms, good health, settling down your breathing, really choosing to have a child, wanting a child, sending it out to the universe, 
and if it is an intended experience for you and the right person has come in and I want to comment about that real quick I know we're coming a little close to the end of the night part of the genetic this is listen to this part of the genetics in every woman whether she realizes it or not, is to seek the best mate, the best male, to give her the best chance to bear a child. She will seek it. That will be influenced, and those decisions can be distorted through drugs, alcohol, and abuse. But left unto its own, uninterrupted by drugs, alcohol, abuse, the woman will pick, typically pick the best male figure for her. Not the guy that plays tennis with her the best or makes her laugh a lot. She will pick the best instinctive partner for her baby. Just remember that. So as you're preparing for this child, and if you're thinking about it, make sure you are ripe, you are ready, you are aware, all of that. Okay? I'm going to let this finish. Finally, I just want to make a couple of quick events. Uh, just stay with me for a minute. Uh, next Sunday night, once again, May 14th. That's Sunday night, May 14th. It's an open evening. Robert, what happened to you? Are you a complete nut? Whatever you want to ask me, I'll answer it for you. You know, many of you know I'm a recovering alcoholic. Many of you know I have a child with special needs. There's a lot to my background. I lived in Japan and so on and so on and so on. You can ask me anything. I have no problem. I'll tell you. As long as it's appropriate and done with the right taste in mind, I'll be happy to answer it. Next. Uh, for my friends who live locally to Merrick, Belmore, in around Long Island area, if you're in the area, this Wednesday morning, this Wednesday, at my office in Merrick, we have Love Never Ends. It's called the Gallery Reading. We've got several openings available yet, just a few, but we're welcome to meet you. You just got to go online, robertehanson.com, and you can register. If you can't make the morning one, I also put one on Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. And this is not just about mothers. Yes, it's Mother's Day week, and a lot of people are looking for their moms. But this is open to anything that comes through your mother's brother, your grandmother, your father's mother. It doesn't matter, your godmother, anything. So this Wednesday morning, 10 o'clock, this Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. It is a Mother's Day week, yes, but it's open to any kind of readings going on. Love never ends, 10 o'clock, 7 o'clock at night. Also, for those people that are interested, and we've talked about this before, we get a lot of people that want to meet with me privately, a lot. So what we've had is we've had the circle of spirits, we call it. It's only for six people. Six. I make this comment every week, and we always fill these up because people just get so much from it. It's six people in a private group with me. Just me, just six people at my office in Merrick Town, where I live, right in this community. You come here, you meet me. We stay for two hours. Two hours. Everyone gets read, or I'll stay there till 3 in the morning to read you. It won't matter. I will stay until everyone gets read, but everyone will be read. And it's a life-changing experience. We have that on May 9th. That's May 9th from 7 to 9. And then we have it again on the Saturday before Mother's Day, the Saturday right before it, from 12 to 2 at my office in Merrick, Circle of Spirits, taking only six people. If you're interested, you call the office at, uh, you call, I'm sorry, excuse me, you, you go to the website, robertehanson.com, robertehanson.com. That's where you sign up for it. And um, you'll get all the information. You just go right there. If you'd like to join me, I'd love to see you guys, especially during Mother's Day. Father's Day is right around the corner. It's a great time of year. People are celebrating life. I'd love to be with you. It's a spring season. Uh, help you shed some of the suffering and really have a great experience. So listen, guys, I hope you enjoyed tonight. For all the beautiful mothers out there, if I don't get a chance to say it to you, happy Mother's Day to you. If your mother is in spirit, happy Mother's Day. Grandma's people that acted as mothers, aunts, sisters, next door neighbors, foster care, adopted, you name it. If you have taken your heart and have given it to a child, if you've acted as a mother to someone who really needs someone to look up to, who can really count on you, on behalf of all the children, really, behalf of all the children, thank you so much for being a great mom. And if you find that You've struggled being a mother. It's been too much of a challenge. Ask for help. Ask for guidance. Your child needs you. They love you. They're counting on you. They're counting on you. They have little voices. They need us. Please. And if you're not sure, send me a text. Send me an email. Let me know how you're doing. I just want to help you out if I can. Okay? 
on behalf of my own wife, Kathleen, on behalf of my own mother, who was in God's gentle care, namaste. Thank you all so very much. Good night.